donate to either Dr. Clark's ministry or our ministry, um, our email address and um, all the information that you will need. So the questions can be posted again in the chat section in Zoom or on YouTube. Um, we have about um, what hour or a bit more, Dr. Clark, can you um, tell us how much time we can dedicate to this session today? Well, certainly an hour and a half. We'll see how we go. <laughs> okay, very good. So an hour and a half sounds good. And um, yeah, we already have um, quite a few questions lined up. And if anyone has more questions, please type them in the chat section. And um, yeah, I guess we'll um, try to address them after all the other questions that we received um, previously. So um, with saying that... Um, I'm just trying to, okay. Okay, so let's start with um, a word of prayer. Would you like to start, Dr. Clark? Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for this time, we can all share together thinking about health and uh, some uh, questions and maybe some of the finer details. We pray, Lord, it will always uh, be recognizing that uh, you are the source of health. You said you came to bring life and bring it more abundantly. You said that you wish above all things that we might prosper and be in health even as our souls prosper. And Lord, we pray that we'll understand how best to cooperate with you in the process of obtaining especially physical health but also spiritual health. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So I'll start recording. And so um, I'm excited about these questions. Um, okay. So the first question what kind of bread can we, uh, what kind of bread can we make if not yeast or sourdough bread? Because we know, Dr. Clark, you addressed the yeast and um, the sourdough um, issue because of the fermentation going on um, in the process of bread making. Um, I remember Ellen White mentioning uh, bread that um, gruel, bread or similar bread that I remember her mentioning. Um, what bread would you recommend and what bread is Ellen White referring to or um, advising us to make, please? Yes, you know, this is a good question. And uh, uh, sometimes there's finer points of, of discussion that, uh, that we get into. And uh, just remembering that uh, we're taking this from a standpoint of uh, medical science, uh, and uh, what's been learned through laboratory studies or, or what's uh, mentioned in the literature. And uh, some of it has absolutely nothing to do with, you know, salvational issues per se. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, a lot of people will have a better health if they can follow the best uh, possible plan. And so our discussion about yeast bread and sourdough, uh, we had a whole discussion on sourdough. And if you go to my website under newsletter articles, we have a whole article on sourdough. And yes, yeast and sourdough both uh, have, a, have, have to do with, with fermentation. And if they have to do with fermentation, then there's uh, always uh, some uh, uh, results of fermentation left behind. And if you've read Ellen White on the whole process of making uh, yeast uh, raised or sourdough raised bread uh, uh, fit for, for consumption, she talks about letting it uh, sit overnight or even for two or three days. And we would say to off gas uh, different uh, products of fermentation, different chemicals that are created. And if, if you look at the science, there's about seven different uh, unhelpful chemicals that are produced in yeast bread uh, or sourdough bread that uh, yeah really should be gotten rid of before you 
you eat that bread. And if you go down to the shop and you buy a loaf of bread, it's in a plastic bag. And, and I went to a, a bread making factory uh, on a field trip and uh, they were making bread. And just as soon as the bread was uh, come through the machine and, and they had sliced it, um, they, uh, <laughs> it was a, a machine that blew the bag up and another machine that, you know, pushed the loaf into the bag and then, and then the uh, ceiling tab put on it. And, and so all the products of, uh, of yeast fermentation or sourdough were captured in that plastic bag and held in the bread. No, no possibility of off-gassing. So all commercial bread, you know, really you should take and, and let it off gas somehow. Um, I, we have a wood heater in our house. And so the other day I put a bunch of racks on top of the wood heater and spread out a whole, well, half of a loaf of bread, all, all the slices and, and let it uh, dry out. Uh, what we call making it into, what Alan White calls making it into Zweibach or twice uh, baked bread. And um, there's also, you know, what people use as toasters that uh, can also be beneficial in, in off gassing these things. But if you look at Ellen White and what she was recommending and what she was talking about, she started uh, talking about all the problems they had with making yeast or sourdough bread and um, started going toward what she called uh, uh, gems or even gram gems or, um, and what's a gem? Well, I was at an antique shop uh, yesterday and they had some gem pans. Now what's a gem pan? Well, it's basically a cast iron pan with uh, cups that uh, are sometimes different shapes. Uh, where I was, they had some shaped like round like muffins or, or long and it looked like a co cob of corn, corn on the cob, uh, or another one that just looked uh, straight long uh, um, troughs that would uh, hold uh, the, any kind of dough you'd put in it. And these gram gem pans are made out of heavy cast iron. And so she talked about taking your heavy cast iron gem pan, putting it in the oven, getting it hot, and then you make this uh, gram uh, or gem uh, uh, dough. Um, and and she, she gave several reasons why it was better. One was that you could add things to it that you couldn't otherwise. So if you make yeast bread and you put any kind of milk with it, I would assume uh, animal milk as well as, uh, you know, soy milk, almond milk, uh, uh, rice milk, some kind of alternative milk. Anyway, if you put milk with it, then its uh, shelf life goes down, its likelihood of going sour goes up, and uh, its danger to health goes up. And so she said, though, with, the grant, with, with making the uh, um, gems, you didn't have that danger. You could add milk to the dough. And so the usual recipes were, were uh, make, you know, having milk. Um, in our case, we'd probably use almond milk and uh, mix it with enough uh, um, flour, grain flour of whatever kind, until it made a fairly thin batter, maybe like pancake batter. Mm -hmm. And then you pour it into these uh, gem pans that are already preheated in the oven, highly heated. And then uh, the, the object is, is that when you put the um, thin, uh, dough mixture into these pans that are heated, it will have a tendency to make it rise um, just by sheer heat. And having a large, uh, heavy cast iron uh, uh, cooking uh, um, apparatus, there would be a lot of heat to go into the dough. And in fact, uh, I've worked in bakeries before here in the United States, uh, commercial bakeries, where you had uh, big rotisserie ovens and every shelf was uh, about uh, um, five centimeters thick and, uh, and, and made, out of, made out of stone, maybe, maybe soapstone or, or granite. Uh, anyway, 
Um, and so we would put the bread into pans and then put it on that big stone in the rotisserie oven. And the stone then would heat the bread and it would, it would grow faster. It would graze faster. It would raise uh, more efficiently with the extra heat being pumped into it really fast. And so the same would be true of like pizza ovens where you have a big stone. Uh, we, we recently bought a big stone for our oven. I went to a, um, a shop that sells granite uh, um, uh, tops for your counters in your kitchen. I said, you got any pieces of granite? Uh, you know, I want to use it for a pizza stone in my oven or for a breadstone in my oven. And they said, oh, let's see, let's look around. Oh, here, our machine's running right now, cutting out. Yeah, here, we just cut out a sinkhole, uh, you know, a hole for a sink and a counter. And so that would, you know, you can have this. And so I took this, uh, you know, the piece they'd cut out for the sink out of the counter and took it home and, you know, you stick it in the oven. And so you heat that up and then, and then you take and you put your gram um, mixture what is gram flour? Gram flour was a, a lighter flour. Basically, they took uh, whole wheat flour and sieved it a bit to remove some of the more uh, heavy components. Uh, it wasn't quite like white flour. It wasn't that fine a sieve or that process, but it was reducing perhaps uh, some of the bran and germ to a certain degree. It was lighter that way and uh, made for lighter, lighter products. So anyway, you take a, have a big pizza stone or big stone like I'm talking about in your oven, and then you can make your flat breads that don't have any yeast or baking soda or sourdough uh, rotten uh, mixture in them. And, uh, and then it can be more healthy that way. And so Ellen White was moving more toward what we would call or what the Bible would call unleavened bread. And why unleavened bread? Well, the reason they unleavened bread was so that they could uh, be more uh, spiritual, be more in contact with God, have a clearer mind. And uh, so leavening would tend to have all these products of fermentation that wouldn't help uh, Israel during their spiritual journey on their feast days. And so the graham bread and so different type of flours are used to, you know, corn flour is a very popular one for graham. Oh, I'm not for gram, but for gems. Um, uh, we make one that's half corn, half soy. Uh, it's a flat bread that we enjoy. But anyway, I hope that answers the question on the yeast or sourdough bread and the alternative being unleavened bread, but made with uh, either heavy um, baking pans that uh, help mm -hmm. the dough rise or with a pizza stone or a, a baking stone that helps it rise yeah absolutely so that actually right um raises another question that um i've heard about um the fermentation process or um sourdough actually helping the uh, the proteins to break down easily like pre-digesting sort of thing um before we um bake the bread because of like hybridized wheat and um the wheat these days that we use is more difficult to digest like um that's uh, I, I guess one thing i thought with the unleavened bread that could be an issue because um the proteins in um in the wheat are not like as easy to digest do you think there is any science to that or well there's no question that the bugs that are eating your wheat product before you make it into bread and sourdough <laughs> or wheat are definitely able to digest whatever it is um, whether or not that makes it uh, more healthy or not is part of the discussion. <clears throat> and uh, so, excuse me, <clears throat> um, so it's, it's, it's not that you want something else to have eaten your food before you do. I mean, people would argue the same thing. You feed the cow the wheat and you eat the cow. And <laughs> um, <laughs> is that any better? Um the goal would be the most healthy and wheat isn't the only product you can put into gems. Like I said, we use corn and soy. So you totally escape the whole issue of, of, of gluten and 
and the wheat problems. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, you can find a bacteria that'll clean up all kinds of messes for you. And sourdough bread is basically bacteria bread. Uh, well, I had a friend who, whose whole, well, his whole business was uh, um, culturing bacteria and picking out bacteria that would clean up uh, toxic wastes. Uh, and he would go to a big company that was uh, getting uh, slapped on the hand for making a mess of the environment. And he would uh, either engineer a bacteria or select a bacteria that would clean up the mess for them. And so you can get a bacteria to clean up anything, including, you know, the protein and wheat, but whether or not you want to eat that bacteria, I guess, is the next question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I guess there is another, um, uh, I guess that's another reason to bake your own bread, the fact that you mentioned. And I guess a lot of us have no idea about the, the gases or fumes that you you get when you actually the hot bread you just um, package it straight away into a plastic bag um, yeah that's another reason I guess to make your own bread and you know what has gone in it and um, yeah the process of packaging the bread even yeah you know if we get into the finer details of bread making <laughs> if you go down to the shop and you buy some wheat flour for the most part, uh, it is usually not ground. It is rolled until it's flour. In other words, just like making rolled oats or you know oatmeal, what they do is they make it uh, somewhat wet and they run it through rollers that get uh, less and less space between the rollers until you get to uh, get flour. And being a wet process, it's yeah. uh, subject to molds and uh, you can end up uh, with more problems. That's one reason why wheat has problems. So the best thing is to stone grind your own and you can buy stone grinders. And when you grind your own, you grind it fresh. When you grind it fresh, then you maintain the nutrients of the wheat and it doesn't go uh, rancid in its oils and especially in its germ. And uh, so there's a lot of benefits to just having your own grinder and make, and, and you can that way get your own organic wheat why organic? Well, for me, I'm a, I react to wheat if it's not organic because it has glyphosate in it. Wow. Now, next week, we'll talk about the shortage of wheat and where you might not be making any wheat bread shortly, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, no, very good information. I guess there's a lot we can know, but if we make our own or if we yeah i guess stay away from non-organic wheat then we can't go wrong with that um so the next question i received is about the inversion tables um what do you think about them how beneficial they are for um back issues and spine issues personally we we got one um and i, I haven't really been using it so what is your take on that Yes, the idea behind an inversion table is basically you can hang upside down uh, fairly efficiently in order to um, put uh, attraction on your spine. And uh, they were quite popular here in America until a few people in hanging upside down got too much blood to their head and got a stroke. And then they got less popular out here. It wasn't, uh, you know, a lot of people, but, uh, and so they started developing machines that put traction on you while you're laying instead of going upside down. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the most effective ones are not ones that just hold a steady traction, but uh, that uh, cycle the traction. They like, mm -hmm. uh, uh, they're, they're not fast, they're slow, but they're unpredictable in the sense that they'll pull and then they'll relax and they'll pull hard and then they'll relax and they'll pull easy and they'll relax. And, and uh, now you'll notice uh, in, our, in our talk uh, on uh, um, back pain um, mm -hmm. that uh, we don't uh, mention that kind of thing. Um, that we didn't talk about uh, um, any kind of traction device, but mm -hmm. we talked about a lot of stretches you could do. And, uh, but I'll tell you, I had uh, 
back issues a few years ago. <laughs> the back issue was I was in a motor vehicle accident and broke one of my vertebra. And I found it quite, uh, you know, found relief in, in hanging upside down. I didn't have an inversion table, but I just, uh, you know, went out to chin up bar and put my legs over it instead of my hands and hung upside down and, and it felt uh, better. Um, so, you know, you kind of suit yourself on that. Uh, if you're not uh, prone to stroke, in other words, you don't have high blood pressure, you don't eat a lot of salt, if uh, mm -hmm. strokes don't run in your family, and you don't do it for long periods of time, you'd be better off, uh, you know, doing it for three to five minutes at most, and then, and then uh, uninverting for a little bit, and then doing it again. Then there might, you know, if it find if you find relief with it, then, then uh, be aware that there can be some you know, some hazards. Yeah, yeah, that's um, a good idea. I've tried hanging upside down from monkey bars in um, one of our parks, but then, yeah, um, I'm not as courageous anymore these days. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, someone is asking, they said, you quoted from um, Ellen White um, to understand the dependence of one organ upon another for the healthful action of all. Could you please explain all these actions to us? I guess I'm not sure <laughs> how much of um, all the actions you can explain to us, Dr. Clark, but I guess, yeah, um, the interaction of different organs with each other and um, however much you can explain in a short time. Yes, you know, uh, the study of physiology is a study that we're supposed to take up. We're supposed to teach our children. And, uh, and so there's a lot of uh, importance in understanding uh, physiology to, to health. And, and really the physiological basis of disease is something that modern medicine has lost sight of. Uh, most of the time, uh, your education is based on epidemiology, not on physiology and, or, or on studies. And um, so let us give one example here and think about it a little bit. Uh, uh, the biggest thing we think about uh, independence is circulation. And Ellen White says that perfect health depends on perfect circulation. And so every organ in your body has circulation, your brain, your kidneys, your liver, your uh, spleen and so forth. And if the circulation becomes uh, stagnant, or inefficient or congested, then you end up with problems uh, with that organ. And so if the heart isn't working well, then the kidneys won't be working well. If the heart isn't working well, then the brain won't be working well. And things that uh, affect circulation, uh, we discuss a lot in our arthritis talk, but uh, the things that affect circulation are, first of all, for a lot of people, uh, they don't drink enough water. So if you don't drink enough water, you don't have enough blood, your blood is too thick, your blood doesn't go everywhere very well, and you end up with thick blood and a high blood pressure to get your blood to pump around. And when you have high blood pressure, then it affects your brain and affects your kidneys. And, and another thing that happens with people in their circulation is they don't clothe their arms and legs as well as they clothe their trunk. So they'll have uh, clothing that leaves the arms bare, the legs bare. And uh, with any temperature difference between them and the outside world, it tends to chill the blood back from the extremities. The blood vessels and extremities tighten down and the blood then uh, uh, stagnates or congests in the chest, abdomen, pelvis and head. And so people get more nosebleeds, people get more thyroid problems, people get more prostate problems, people get more uh, congestion blood in the intestines and more digestive problems, everything gets out of haywire with the circulation when uh, the circulation can't go evenly to all parts of the body. And Ellen White talks about if your arms are bare, then your blood comes back chilled into your chest, it inflames the lung, and then lungs get, uh, get diseases. And those lung diseases then could be asthma or, you know, bronchitis or, or things like that. And, um, or even emphysema, but emphysema would have other causes as well. And so people uh, find that uh, their 
their, their blood circulation affects all the organs. And so that would be one dependence of one organ upon another for the healthful action mm -hmm. of all. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, so the next question we receive starts um, with a thank you. The person says, big thank you for organizing uh, the time with Dr. Clark. Um, thank you to Dr. Clark as well for all the valuable information. Appreciate it very much. The question is um, um, for Dr. Clark. Um, uh, is the following. My husband has a severe allergy to bananas and has, um, and has to have an EpiPen on him at all times. He can't even enter the grocery shops unless bananas are still quite green. We also always have to check and ask people to hide the bananas if visiting. And many times we had to leave the train, room, church, wherever someone started eating a banana. If it happens um, that he comes into the proximity of a ripe banana, he gets very dizzy and also gets arrhythmic heart palpitations. In short, very unpleasant and inconvenient to say the least. Could Dr. Clark let us know if he believes there is a way out of it and um, what could we do? This is a pretty severe sensitivity to, to a food. Um, but uh, it's not, uh, you know, incomprehensible. It's, it's got a physiological basis to it. And uh, some people I've known are allergic to the gas that they use to ripen bananas. This sounds like it's uh, not just that, but just thinking about that. There's one family I know that if they make sure and get bananas that haven't been gassed, that they do much better. Whereas if they get bananas that have been you know, chemically uh, ripened, they have trouble. But that said, uh, so knowing that you have this allergy, there's a number of ways to approach this. Uh, I, I've known people who had allergies to all kinds of seasonal uh, pollens. And uh, when they went to a mostly fresh fruit and vegetable diet, their allergies went away totally. We had a lady who went and traveled with us and did uh, cooking schools. And, uh, and, and so she would do a cooking school ahead of our, our, our health talks. And uh, she was allergic uh, to pollens that would come out in the spring. And, and, uh, and so her eyes would be red, her cheeks would be red. And, but then she and her, her friends decided, we're going we're gonna to try experiment we've been teaching vegan cookings for you know all these years but let's try going raw for six weeks and so her friend who's going through menopause and herself decided okay we're going to eat only fresh fruits and vegetables and things that haven't been cooked well during that time the friend who's having menopause issues issues her menopause issues all went away her hot flashes and so forth and our friend, her allergies totally went away. And she had to come in contact with things she knew that would cause allergies. And she ended up having no allergies to the usual allergies to these things. And so eating food, uh, food that's been processed and cooked and, or even fermented will, will cause you to be more likely to react to things in your environment. Whereas eating lots of fresh fruits and vegetables will reduce that by their antioxidant power, by their uh, um, nutrient density. And so that would be one thing to do is, is to uh, make sure, uh, try eating only things that are unprocessed and see what happens. The other thing to do is uh, you can buy, and we have um, masks, you know, not everybody's wearing a mask for their COVID. <laughs> Uh, you can buy masks that have uh, carbon fiber or charcoal in them. Uh, masks uh, that uh, look a lot like the masks people are wearing for COVID, but that, uh, but that actually have as good a uh, ability to filter out toxins as a World War II uh, canister mask. And uh, so if you know you're coming in the proximity of bananas, putting on one of these uh, charcoal carbon masks, uh, 
Uh, we have friends, at least in America, that sell them through their website, which is buyactivatedcharcoal.com. Buyactivatedcharcoal.com. And, uh, and so that would be one thing you could do. Um, the, uh, the question would be, is there other things in the same family of bananas that are causing the same problem? And you'd want to sort out, is it the chemical they're putting it on it to ripen it, or is it the banana itself? And, uh, but, uh, you know, allergies, there's a whole nother study. And, uh, and people, uh, there's ways of getting people who aren't too sensitive. You know, if you're so sensitive that uh, you go into trouble with just, you know, the sight or sound or smell of the thing, uh, it's hard to deal with and, and desensitize yourself. But alternative allergists will take uh, a... A, a, a food to which you are allergic and will make a, a liquid out of it, a tincture out of it, and have people hold the tincture under their tongue for 15 minutes prior to coming in contact either by eating or whatever to a thing to which you're allergic. And what this does is it presents to the dendritic cells of your digestive system, which uh, uh, you know are uh, in your mouth, surround your mouth and uh, those dendritic cells then will identify whatever it is that uh, was put in that tincture as food and tell the body not to overreact and uh, that way train the immune system to accept uh, certain uh, foods they didn't otherwise find acceptable and so there are ways of desensitizing um, and uh, and you know there's another aspect we don't like to think about or talk about but i've known people with allergies to things uh, severe allergy who went through an exorcism and their allergy went away i mean that's a, a whole nother field that's not my field but anyway i just uh, put that out on the table because it exists so there's your banana discussion okay um, there's also another thing, Dr. Clark, like a secondary allergy. Do you believe that that is, um, that could be the case? Um, I mean, you did touch a little bit on it, but like, um, I've had a client that, um, that came to me for, because she believed that she was allergic to wheat. And I told her that she could be allergic, um, to dairy as, a a primary allergy and when she stay away uh, stayed away from dairy for a while she actually found that her gluten sensitivity um was not as bad do you be do you believe that it could be sometimes like a primary um allergy could be like dairy or something else or like you said even the chemicals that are sprayed or um guessed um the bananas with that if you go completely vegan, for example, or even, um, as you said, completely raw, like, um, yeah, that allergy could, could go away. Yes, sometimes there's cross reactivity. A good example is latex. And, uh, mm -hmm. and then people who are allergic to latex or are allergic to other plants in the family or, or, or mangoes or, or, or something else. And uh, it's true that uh, there's cross reactivity between antigens. Um, it's also true that uh, some products set you up for allergies. Milk products will set you up for allergy to anything else because they're highly inflammatory. And the other thing can happen is the cow can be eating what you're allergic to, and then it can cross mm -hmm. over into the cow's milk. Yeah. That's really interesting, especially that part that um, your food might be eating something you shouldn't be eating. <laughs> <laughs> and this happens with mothers who breastfeed, who sometimes they eat something that uh, will, 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 will antagonize the child. Yeah. Um, okay, well, um, yeah, we hope that answers that question. Um, what about um, Dr. Clark, you know how when we are pregnant, we're told not to eat the brassicas or um, cabbage, cauliflower, stuff like that, or onion and garlic. I mean, I personally tried to stay away from um, the chilies and spicy things. 
um, with the with my second, um, not the pregnancy, sorry, um, uh, with breastfeeding. When you when you breastfeeding, like I tried to stay away from um, the chilies or spicy things. But what about um, the brassicas? Is there any science to it as well, or the cabbage and that you should stay away because it gives the babies gas? That's a good question. I think it would probably be individual experience. <clears throat> so I would, uh, you know, if you're having troubles like with the colic, <clears throat> excuse me, or something else, then it'd probably be worthwhile doing a bit of a, what we call elimination diet. In elimination diet, you are trying to find out what's causing the problem. And in this case, you know, doing the elimination diet for the mother, um, would definitely be in order if, if you're finding the baby having symptoms that are, are not helpful. Yeah, okay. Um, so the next question is, what is your take on cooked or raw leftovers, Dr. Clark? How much of the vitamins we are losing when cooking and when reheating? I know a couple from our church actually um I, I don't know the couple myself but i've been told that there is actually a couple that when they cook they cook only enough for that meal and that's it they don't use the rest or they don't reheat um the rest i guess if you can touch on the cooked ones and then the raw ones as well when we chop up like the salads and put in the fridge are we losing some of the nutrients or um what are we losing what's still um retained in the food Yes, uh, good question. And uh, we had, when I was uh, in medical school, we had a babysitter for our oldest child who uh, would never eat anything left over. And she was like 76 and quite bright and healthy. And, and uh, she figured that if it was left over, it had lost nutrients. So there's no question that uh, foods, the longer they are from their original source are going to lose nutrition. Uh, it's also true that when you cut things, they can oxidize. Uh, I remember when I, uh, I worked in food service for a while. Mm -hmm. And um, when I worked in food service, the uh, food service said, now if you take and you tear the lettuce and making your salad, it's going to tear along uh, cell lines and the lettuce won't go bad as fast as if you put it on the chopping board and cut it with a knife and cut it across cell lines. And so our job was to make salad and to tear the, the lettuce rather than chop it. So there's, there's uh, <laughs> and, and, and it lasted longer that way in, you know, in the fridge mm -hmm. and so forth. And um, so I'm sure there's a certain amount of uh, wisdom to that, uh, making as much as what you're going to use for that meal and no more. It's a bit of a challenge, you know, because then you end up saying, well, if I don't eat this, I have to throw it out. So, <laughs> you know how that is. <laughs> you might end up um, overeating. I might end up overeating. <laughs> well, that's when, that's when it's good to have, I guess, a dog or something to, <laughs> to feed the leftovers. <laughs> Um, so yeah, there's, there's certainly wisdom to eating food as fresh as possible and, and, and then not, uh, uh, you know, once you've processed it. So some things you process, you know, like talking about wheat, we mentioned wheat earlier and grinding it fresh for your bread. And, and one of the challenges is buying, buying wheat uh, that's already ground or flour from the store. You, you know, you're more likely to have rancid, uh, elements in that, uh, product. Mm-hmm. I haven't heard about garlic that it's different when you chop the garlic. It's different from when you crush the garlic, like crushed gar uh, garlic is very different. Um, like the cellular structure changes somehow when you crush it as opposed to just chopping. So it just puts in a perspective that you think that uh, these are living things that you are dealing with. So you should handle them carefully. <laughs> yes, you know, and the, the thing on garlic is you're trying to develop the, was it anison or, um, I'm not sure I'm saying that right, but there's a phytochemical in garlic that's especially good for you. 
And uh, if you crush it and leave it set for 15 minutes before you apply it, you know, add it to other ingredients, it develops that uh, nutrient property better uh, with that uh, amount of time. So yeah, this is, food preparation is uh, quite a, quite a science. Ellen White says she, she spent more time figuring out or, or recruiting a good cook than anybody else in her whole staff because the cook was the most important person. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It is very important. I find that if I overeat or if I eat things that don't agree with each other, I end up with foggy brain and I don't get to do as much as if, you know, I ate a bit less or. <laughs> yeah, um, makes a difference. Yeah. yeah. So it is important. So, um, okay. And the next question is, can Dr. Clark elaborate on the impact of general anesthetic on the frontal lobe of the brain? And he mentioned this during the presentation on drug medications. Yes, uh, thanks for that question. Um, and um, uh, so I have another friend who's a medical missionary here in the United States that when we came over to Australia, we, we, we turned over all our contacts to him. He became our <laughs> liaison over here and, and took our appointments. And, and, uh, and mm -hmm. he was a nurse in an operating room, an operating theater. And uh, he liked to research and study. He's a very good researcher. And he went and asked the anesthesiologist, how, you know, you're giving the patient all these anesthetic drugs. What physiologically, what mechanism is actually taking place that puts the patient to sleep? Mm -hmm. And the anesthesiologist says, I don't know. <laughs> and, and so our friend decided to do a bunch of research into it and look up, you know, well, what's going on? How, why does the patient go to sleep? And, and after looking at it and the studies on it, his conclusion was, uh, well, the evidence was that it, it just shuts down the frontal lobes of the brain so that uh, the patient doesn't uh, process the pain, the, um, the experience, or even let it go into memory. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, from a Christian perspective, that wasn't, you know, a real great thing to have going on. And so he started looking into it more and, and just started watching patients. And the patient came in who was in an automobile accident but needed a surgery for an internal bleeding problem. And when he went to the operating room, uh, he was happy, uh, went under anesthetic came out, went through recovery, and he was upset, angry, frustrated, um, and, uh, you know, the shutting down of his brain had caused a personality change or, or disposition change, and so our friends started looking into it more, and, and, I, and I remember when I, was, when I was in training and in the operating room all the time, um, it was sort of left to the anesthesiologist or the nurses or, or the charge person to select the music <laughs> or, or the attending physician. And I mean to tell you, some of the worst music you can imagine, they would play and it's like, you know, stuff I didn't want to listen to, but the mm -hmm. physician in charge, would, well, this is, so you have the frontal lobes of the brain shut down and you're pounding this music into these people who are totally vulnerable. And our Sabbath school quarterly, oh, maybe a year and a half ago or so, had a story. I mean, I've got it right here in my Bible. Uh, I pulled a page out of, the, out of the story where this kid had a heart problem and the heart problem was such that when he was young, he had a surgery for it and the surgery went well, but then later on in life, it recurred to a certain extent. So this was mm -hmm. the subject of the, of the story. They took him back to surgery and he came out demon possessed. Uh, and it wasn't until they did an exorcism and got rid of the demon that his life turned around. And, and it was like, whoa, okay, it happened. They probably took him into the operating room, shut down his frontal lobes with all these drugs, 
And that uh, is basically shuts down your conscience, your ability to reason right or wrong, uh, ability to call on God. You shut down that part of his brain, turn on the Satan's music and pump the devil into him. And, uh, and so then they did this uh, prayer and exorcism. That was the subject of the story, you know, that, uh, you know, we had a winner here that God got rid of the demon, but how do you get the demon in the first place? So his brain was shut down for surgery and they're probably doing something untoward in the, in the surgery. Yeah. It's probably worth mentioning as well, Dr. Clark. I, I don't know how much everyone knows about Scott Ritterma, if I'm saying his name correctly. I don't know. He's got series on media, media on the brain. It's very, very sorry. Yeah, very good series. Yeah, so that's just something that I guess we can recommend for people to watch. We've got his book as well. It's very interesting about the frontal lobe and how like we are when we're watching TV and when we are listening to music, I guess very often we are like passively just um, taking the information in. Um, so I guess, yeah, um, like you mentioned about the music while we are um, being operated on. It's just important, I guess, at least if someone you, you, you mentioned in the um, uh, spiritualistic practices seminar as well, that at least uh, maybe take like a, a classical music CD or something, if you're going <laughs> to go through that. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So these are good series to watch media on the brain. Um Okay, so uh, the next question, uh, what is the natural recovery road from use of antibiotics? Antibiotics are very strong chemicals, very strong medications. Antibiotics uh, there are there usually to stop uh, dangerous bacteria from taking over. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are not uh, as selective as we might hope. And as such, they tend to wipe out uh, good bacteria with bad bacteria. The result is that uh, your whole gut flora can be changed for the worse. There's a lot of discussion these days about the gut brain connection, the gut thyroid connection, the gut uh, whatever connection. And it's very true that whatever bugs are in your intestines have a dramatic effect on the rest of your body in that they're putting off either toxins or good things or certain bacteria are beneficial and certain bacteria are unbeneficial. Mm -hmm. And so when you take an antibiotic, uh, you often greatly decrease uh, the um, number and, uh, and, and diversity of bacteria in your gut. And, and so you want to re-achieve that. I mean, certain bacteria in your gut will increase Alzheimer's, others won't. Certain bacteria in your gut will increase obesity, others won't. Certain mm -hmm. bacteria in your gut will increase autoimmune disease uh, and others fight it. And uh, so people who are on a good diet and good lifestyle, they tend to cultivate uh, bacteria that are helpful for health. And so when we have somebody goes through an experience where they think they have to take an antibiotic, which goes back to our <laughs> drug lecture discussion. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and just to revisit that, uh, taking penicillin for a lifetime total accumulative dose of six weeks increases your risk of cancer by 20% because it's just a, it's a mold, it's, it's fermentation. But that aside, uh, you want to restore the bacteria after such a devastating experience. Mm -hmm. And so you can, the best thing is to get a good prebiotic. What's a good prebiotic? Well, it's basically eating food that, to, that to supports or nurtures uh, the good bacteria you want to have living in your gut. Uh, sometimes it becomes necessary in order to achieve the right bacteria is to get a probiotic. But I must just warn you right off the top that uh, right from the beginning that m most of what they sell in health food shops and supermarkets for a probiotic 
are bacterial strains that you don't want. Um, mm -hmm. My son Connor had a problem of a um, gut issue, which he has relative to certain uh, sugars. Um, and so we thought, you know, maybe he needs a probiotic. So I looked up which strains of bacteria I wanted, which were the good ones, which were not fermentative or facultative or toxin producing or gas producing, but which were healthy, would make your gut happy, would restore balance. And I went to town and I visited several health food shops and supermarkets. I went in the first health food shop. They probably had, I'm going to say, 25 different products for probiotics. And uh, only two of them had, had, had good uh, bacteria in them. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them had stuff you de definitely didn't want. And uh, so... <laughs> Um, yeah, so it was, uh, it was an interesting experience. So then, but, but, but the, the ones, the only two that were good, they said, well, these here, we have them here in our, in our fridge for, you know, but they're only available by prescription from say, uh, one of their associated uh, nature paths or somebody who was, you know, sort of uh, had had told the shop to order these and put them on there so they could send patients down to buy it. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So then I went to a supermarket and found found one that had the right strains. But that mm -hmm. said, you know, the, the book answer then is you get a pro you get a you get an antibiotic, then you dump a bunch of prebiotic probiotics on yourself and try to restore the right to flora and uh, and then get back to to, to, to the normalcy. Um, that said, you know, again, if you eat a bunch of prebiotics, you're helping yourself. You eat a bunch of probiotics and you don't get prebiotics that are good for making those, those uh, bacteria grow, they'll probably just die anyway. It's like uh, buying a plant down at the store and going to plant it in your garden. But if your garden doesn't have the right pH or the right nutrients, it might not live anyway. So the important thing is to get the right foods that, co that, 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 that support the right bacteria, and that way you'll be healthy after you've had this uh, insult of an antibiotic. I hope that answers <laughs> the question there. Yeah. Well, I can tell you the worst case that can happen to a person. I believe that if I'm not being too dramatic, uh, my mom had COVID and she was in the hospital and they were giving her um, antibiotics um, quite a lot, like to a point where my mom couldn't eat and she was being pumped with the antibiotics. So my dad usually goes along and um, he's, he's quite soft when it comes to confronting the doctor and stuff. So I called him and I said, um, if something happens to my mom, we're going to have we're going to have problems. So you tell the doctor to stop that because my mom couldn't eat and she was um, towards the end, she couldn't even talk. So I actually, I know Dr. Clark, you don't recommend the intravenous vitamin C, but I said, um, tell them because she couldn't eat, um, she couldn't hold anything down. I said, give her intravenous vitamin C and take her off the antibiotics and it's on us. So they did that. And then the next day, my mom started eating and she started eating yogurt. Like I didn't say much about the yogurt stuff because she said, well, I've eaten some good um probiotic yogurt and stuff and um she had the appetite back actually otherwise i i do believe that um yeah um my mom wasn't going very well if she stayed on the antibiotics because the doctor was still saying well it's up to you um but this is what's what's going to heal you this is what's going to save you because your lungs are infected and yeah yeah, so that's a whole discussion with the remdesivir and the antibiotics they give people that get COVID uh, are more dangerous than the COVID itself. Yeah, so that's um, 
that's that issue. I might address a um, couple of the questions that um, we got on Zoom before moving forward with the other questions. So um, the first question that we received on Zoom, let me just quickly um, check. Okay, so... Um, Okay, so I'm going to attempt. Oh, yeah, that's why Dayan said I think Dr. Clark should read it himself. Dr. Clark, that's the <laughs> very first comment in the chat section in Zoom. Um, could you read out the question? Because it's a bit, um, yeah, the terminology is. All right. Uh, what herbs are good for healing the heart of... Uh arrhythmatic uh, or arrhythmogenic uh, right uh, ventricle uh, cardiomyopathy, right bundle branch block, mild uh, dilated uh, right uh, ventricle. How much and how often? And so somebody's having um, problems with the heart and its rhythm and it's uh, different parts of the heart that are related to this and and what herbs are good. And I'll just uh, say right here that uh, some people look at medicine or any kind of healing as looking for something outside of themselves to fix something inside themselves. Mm -hmm. In other words, rather than uh, my approach, so my, my proclaimed profession <laughs> is lifestyle medicine. Our goal is to figure out what you're doing that's causing the problem in the first place and to uh, make you stop doing it. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like the patient comes to the doctor and they say, every time I move my hand like this, my shoulder hurts. Doctor says, well, don't move your hand like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, that's a bit, uh, uh, you know, humorous and, uh, but 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 in truth, that's what we're saying here. So why do people have uh, bundle branch block and and problems with their hearts? Well, it's something they're doing in their life, and it's not a deficiency of some herb. It's uh, something they're doing to cause that. And so they need to figure out. And so Ellen White says, ascertain the cause, find out why. Uh, if you don't know why, your treatment might be contributing to the problem. And so for, for bundle branch blocks and cardiac uh, arrhythmias and, and, uh, and stuff like that, uh, a, a lot of it is psychological. A lot of it comes to the mind-body connection. And uh, so people who are depressed, people who are uh, frustrated with life, people who have anxiety and fear, are much more likely to have these uh, cardiogenic uh, problems and so the cure then, a herb won't cure that. It might just mask it. And, and so you gotta find out why. And so one of the cures that's been discovered that goes along with what Spirit Prophecy says about useful labor is that somebody who has a heart arrhythmia, but they start doing something that they can put their whole heart into. Now we're sort of crossing over here of, of interesting associations when we talk about doing something with your whole heart we're not really talking about what's in your chest, but it affects what's in your chest. And so cardiac arrhythmias have been improved by people working hard, getting their hearts working hard, doing something they believe in and like doing and to feel uh, is useful, meaningful. And, and so what herbs are helpful? Uh, definitely hawthorn berry is sort of a go-to herb for most uh, cardiac things. Um, I must say that uh, on cardiac arrhythmias, let me just get something here to put into the chats um, box that will be stuff that you can look up later. Let me just uh, see where I put it. To, let's see, here we go. Um, I don't know if this will go into the chat. 
but let me just try to put it into the chat. One common arrhythmia that uh, gives all kinds of problems is uh, one here that, uh, nope, I won't go into the chat. All right, let me just email it to you, Sosi, and you can uh, post it. Um, all right, so go into emails, uh, go into your thing, reply. So I'm replying to questions and answers okay. with a whole discussion on uh, herbs and causes of arrhythmias, especially in this case, atrial fibrillation and uh, what to do about it. And mm -hmm. uh, so the person can, you can get that to, to the person. So mm -hmm. Hawthorne berry is good. Um, anything food wise, anything high in vitamin C is gonna be, is gonna be good. Um, especially avoiding MSG. I mean, I can, I'll just go through some of these things in this arrhythmia uh, discussion. Um, anything with MSG is going to be a problem. Marmite, Vegemite, Promite, those are all problems. You know, natural flavors, vinegar, soy sauce, Chinese food, protein isolate, all these are going to affect, you know, your uh, heart. Caffeine, alcohol, they're definitely parts of the problems. Uh, fermented foods, which have tyramine, cheese, wine, uh, any fermented foods, refined sugars and carbohydrates, definitely a problem, excess salt, uh, mm -hmm. fluoride in toothpaste, and, and, and a deficiency of iodine is a big one. So iodine, anything high in iodine, bladder whack, um, kelp, um, uh, these kind of things are going to be herbs that will be beneficial for arrhythmias um so uh you want to eat foods that are you know high in good nutrients good minerals like magnesium such as pumpkin seeds sesame seeds almonds hazelnuts buckwheat kelp spinach kiwi potassium is good as opposed to sodium so potassium is high in a lot of your fresh fruits and vegetables spinach potatoes broccoli carrots celery uh, selenium, Brazil nuts, especially helpful for, for the heart. Um, and, uh, so anyway, you got, you can send that on to them in that, uh, thank you. Email. Um, you know, the big fan, obviously of supplements, Dr. Clark, I think that was, um, yeah, that is one of our next questions, but what do you think about CoQ10 for the heart? as a supplement, would you recommend any supplements for the heart or like the CoQ10 or um, magnesium, obviously, you know, um, like you can get from foods, but um, like magnesium citrate or um, CoQ10, none of them as a supplement? I'm not big on supplements. Uh, I don't like called them patented nostrums. Um, when you, oh, this is like, okay, back to our previous talk. This is like uh, God tells, well, Elisha tells Naaman to go dip in the river seven times. So Naaman goes and dips in the river seven times to cure leprosy. Well, the supplement company comes down and says, oh, this is the seven dip cure. We'll start selling water from that river in tablet form and people can get the seven dip cure and cure their leprosy by what they got from that water. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, well, I don't think that's the answer. And so they discover that people who have higher vitamin A levels in their blood have less cancer. So then they started prescribing vitamin A supplements for prevention of cancer and it caused more cancer because what they decided as was vitamin A was not really a complete answer. Uh, if, if you look at uh, carrots, for example, one study showed there's 273 different active forms of vitamin A. Well, taking one of those 273 different active forms of vitamin A as a mega dose, you're missing the other 272 and you're not getting what you need. And so a supplement tries to isolate one thing without using all things and you end up missing something you really need and so supplements uh, can actually and especially in minerals there's a very fine balance between minerals so you take too much uh, 
too much of one mineral and it knocks out another mineral. You take too much magnesium and it affects your calcium. You take too much calcium and it affects your magnesium. Or you take too much zinc, it affects your copper and your copper goes down and your zinc goes up. And, and But if you eat the food that has the magnesium or the copper or the whatever it is that you're trying to increase, then uh, you're more likely to be in balance and end up with good health. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much for that, um, Dr. Clark. The next question is similar. Um, what criteria is used to determine what is a spice and um, what is a herb? Yes, and this is a good discussion, a good question, and getting into food and food flavoring and food, food mm -hmm. preparation. Um, we're told that the more simple the diet, the better. Uh, modern, uh, in modern times, the goal is to have a wow in every bite to keep customers coming back for your, uh, you know, your restaurant. And so they try to tantalize you with more flavors. And so food is over uh, spiced. Ellen White calls it stimulating food. When you get stimulating food, then uh, you end up not liking plain food. It's like if you're watching TV all the time, you don't like to read your Bible. If you're eating at McDonald's all the time, you don't like to come home and eat your greens. Um, and so there's a certain amount of balance in flavoring, not to over flavor things. That said, I'll give you an example. We have some friends that say, well, we don't like to put onions and garlic in our food all the time. We like to reserve those as medicine. I'm not saying that that's what you have to do it, that that's the right approach, but that's a principle where they're saying you wouldn't eat every day what you want to have as medicine eventually, because if you eat it every day, your body sort of develops a tolerance and so do the bugs in your body or whatever. And uh, when you do need it for medicine, it may not have quite the effect that it would if you were eating it all the time. And so some things that are herbs are also spices. I mean, when we think about COVID and what would fix COVID, I went down to supermarket and I looked at what was on the uh, in the spice section, just to think about if I had somebody with COVID, what I could send them down to the supermarket for. And so sage and rosemary and garlic and onion and and turmeric and and uh, there's all kinds of things. Uh, uh, paprika, things that would actually work good as medicines that you could buy as a spice. And, and, and so it can go either way. Uh, you know, the difference between a herb and a spice is sort of uh, what you decide you're going to use them for. And, uh, and then there's the whole discussion, which uh, spices aren't good for you. And, and, and there's a lot of spices just because they're, they're quite uh, stimulating, quite uh, strong, um, quite fiery, you know, black pepper, red pepper, cayenne pepper are, uh, are sort of hot and, and cause problems. Uh, you know, we'd have a whole discussion in our reflux talk on, on, on spices that increase the likelihood of reflux or heartburn or, or problems with the digestion. And mm -hmm. so what might be a spice uh, might also be a medicine and uh, you might not want just to eat your medicine every day. Mm -hmm. yeah that's very interesting so when um you talked about spice as well in um in a different presentation dr clark um so i'm just wondering with the spicy when you said it raises the acidity in your stomach and raises the body temperature so it's not good can the same be said about like um when we're talking about chilies can the same be said about like onions and garlic and um, for example i i make my own sprouts and um i do like sometimes kale and reddish sprouts which are really spicy so i'm like can the same principle be applied to those um foods as well because those look like herbs to me but they are spicy so do they have the same effect on the stomach or not um, garlic, whereas it is uh, somewhat uh, hot, does not have the same effect to raise the acid in your stomach dramatically mm -hmm. um, as, as the peppers. And we're sort of warned about the peppers. Um, 
Some of it has to do with just reasoning cause to effect, seeing how it affects you and what, uh, what uh, the impact is on your own physiology. Uh, that's something everybody should do in becoming your own best doctor, which you are your own best doctor. <laughs> you should uh, you know, mm -hmm. analyze and say, okay, when I eat this way, what happens? And, and a lot of disease could be figured out if people just kept a good food journal and symptom journal and compared and said, well, wow, every time I, you know, eat uh, hot peppers, my stomach uh, gives me, you know, problems. Or every time I eat this, I have that problem. And so reasoning cause to effect is one of the things we're supposed to do. And mm -hmm. if we don't do that, then we're sort of uh, missing an opportunity to, to see what works for our own physiology. Everybody's a little bit different. Uh, most of the time when we're talking medical studies, we're talking big population studies and we're saying what's general for everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. when, we, when we go to Ellen White, we, we right away find out things that are not good for anybody and things that are good for everybody. But uh, mm -hmm. Ellen White said she couldn't eat beans, but beans you know, for other people are good. Yeah, that is true. Very good. Thank you. Um, what about, Dr. Clark, homeopathic preparations? I personally have some homeopathic uh, medication that I bought for the kids, but I'm a bit skeptical about using them because they all look like white round pills. They are all for different things. They all taste the same. They all look the same. They're all white and sweet. So I just um, don't know what the science is behind that and what are your thoughts on that? Could they be classed as supplements as well? Or, I mean, I know a little bit of um, how they're made, but like well, what place do they have in, um, I guess, in a plant-based whole food diet? For my approach to using things to try to fix your problems other than fixing what caused it to begin with, Mm -hmm. I approach it from the point of view to find out from science what herb is beneficial. So mm -hmm. like, for example, we talked about hawthorne berry for cardiac arrhythmias. And uh, so you look at the science behind the actual herb. Uh, not that the herb was used by, you know, Nostradamus or Edward Casey or whatever. You know, those are mm -hmm. weird sources, but they're people that, you know, yeah. uh, I would find out what science is behind the herb itself. As far as homeopathy goes, homeopathy's whole philosophy is that which causes disease and high doses fixes it in small doses. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if I get a headache from being hit on the head with a big hammer, what will help my headache is to hit myself on the head with a little hammer. It's like... <laughs> All right. No, 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 that doesn't work. And so it really makes no sense at all. Um, and there's a bit of, you know, a bit of spiritualism involved in some of that stuff too, but that's a whole nother topic. But I say, take each thing on its own merits, find out. And I don't know uh, if you want a really good book on, uh, on herbs, there's this one from Australia um, that uh, looks like it's backwards in my <laughs> Uh, how can I use herbs in my daily life by Isabella Shepherd? And that's an Australian book. And that's what we got when we we're over in Australia. Best book I've ever found on herbs. I've got other books on herbs, but, but this one's just really good. And so it goes through the properties of the herbs and, and what's uh, good about them and, and uh, how they're used and how to make them into teas and, and all this kind of stuff. And I mean, it's got a little bit of folklore in there, but it's also got good, uh, you know, uh, some good science to it too. And, mm -hmm. and, and so the best thing is to take each uh, component of the quote unquote medicine or herb and, uh, and discover what uh, value it has for you. So some of these homeopathic, homeopathic rep preparations will also have animal parts in them, livers, you know, pieces of, uh, and so you have to watch out what you get. Okay. So someone says the problem with homeopathic preparations is the spiritual energy involved in its preparation. Um, 
Yeah, I called one time uh, the company that was selling these homeopathic preparations and I asked them how they're made. Um, They didn't say um, anything about the spiritual side of things, but um, it's good to know because then there's lots of herbs that can be used in in their natural form that um, resemble the herb itself. Um, Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and so what we're told as far as herbs go, that uh, we should keep some herbs, uh, set them aside, and when somebody gets sick, we steep them. In other words, we make tea out of them. Uh, We don't keep them in capsules and take the capsules. We don't make them into white uh, little pills and and, uh, have, uh, you know, distilled out uh, some property that we figure is the best property. Uh, we just take the whole herb and make a tea out of it. Mm-hmm. Very good. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, so what are your thoughts about attending salt room therapies, Dr. Clark? That's a good question. I haven't studied a lot into it. Uh, I saw that question there. It would take some uh, some more investigation to, to figure out. Um, and so probably I'll reserve a uh, comment on that for a later time. Mm-hmm. Very good. So um, what about aromatherapies? Uh, is there any evidence to support or refute the use of aromatherapies? Definitely benefits to aromatherapies. Uh, no question that, uh, you know, nebulizing uh, essential oils into the air has an advantage. Uh, it's true that they're trying to uh, duplicate to perhaps what would actually be in nature. Ellen White says there is healing in the fragrance of the pine and the spruce and the fir and the cedar mm-hmm. and in other trees. And of course, you know, there in Australia would be the eucalyptus. And mm-hmm. so she, she mentioned that, uh, you know, you're going to build your sanitarium there, but you're going to cut down all those trees. Don't cut down the trees. Put the sanitarium where the trees aren't because <laughs> the trees were so beneficial. And wow. so in nebulizing or, or using the diffusers to, to get the, 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 the essential oils in the air, we're basically trying to duplicate that or reproduce that effect of having a tree that might be aromatic and, and putting its uh, essence into the air. And so when we talk about COVID, uh, we definitely mentioned and recommended certain uh, essential oils and using them in, in diffusers or nebulizers. And, and that being, uh, yeah, some of those pine oil, cedar oil, lemon oil, citrus oil. Uh, and so we definitely take advantage. Now that said, there is a certain you know, amount of in herbalism and in essential oils that gets into spiritualism, but uh, that doesn't mean that uh, just because you use an essential oil, you're getting into their spiritualism. Mm-hmm. Very good. Um, so um, just, a, I guess, quick mention of this. Someone said, is there any chance healing? Uh, is there any chance of healing Hashimoto's? I know it's an autoimmune disease and I am miffed that I'm making antibodies against myself. Um so I think you um, referred to that in our presentation, autoimmune um, inflammatory diseases. Dr. Clark, is that right? Is that where you mentioned about um, Hashimoto's? Yes, definitely. And um, we covered thyroid as well. And you definitely can reverse it. Uh, you can get over it. Uh, you can uh, fix it. Uh, you just have to figure out why you have it in the first place, whether it's uh, something you're doing in your lifestyle or whether it is uh, uh, emotional, mental, spiritual also. And uh, so autoimmune diseases can be reversed and thyroid can be put back on track without medications. Yeah, um, Dr. Clark does have the talk autoimmune inflammatory diseases, not on, uh, probably not on our page. I would recommend um, to go on the Zoom International School of Prophecy. Is that right, Dr. Clark? You, you must have that presentation with them or on your website. Yeah, either one. We did do that talk for, for your channel as well. Yeah, it was translated. I'm just thinking it would be easier oh, okay. if people watched. Yeah. yeah. 
um, only the English one. Okay, yes, go to Zoom International or to my website. There should be a link there to the thyroid talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> very good. So um, what are your thoughts about osteopathic treatment? Osteopathic treatment. Uh, so we did our discussion about chiropractic. And in our discussion of chiropractic, uh, we uh, talked about the fact that it started, uh, uh, its inspiration, its uh, genesis started with a seance. In the seance, uh, Mr. Um, Palmer um, was told to start a back manipulation profession and to, to use certain techniques. Well, Mr. Stills and Mr. Palmer were, were basically together in all this. And uh, Mr. Stills took it to combine uh, medicine with chiropractic and Mr. Palmer to just uh, have it straight chiropractic. And so there's all kinds of arguments about who taught who and who did what there. And they're both mm -hmm. very associated so there's no difference in whether or not uh, you get a chiropractic adjustment or an osteopathic adjustment. It's all adjustment. It's all come straight out of a seance and uh, it's not part of God's healing method. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you said as well, stretching, simple stretches, I found that um, have very good effect on, on me because I suffer from back pains if I don't look after my back. So... Um, yeah, I've gone to chiropractors as well, and with um, I haven't felt um, much benefit from those things. Um, okay, so the next question we are nearing the end of, um, I guess, our time that we can use, but um, we quickly uh, quickly will start. Um, I try to go through all these questions. Um, so it says, when someone is confronted with cancer, the usual medical protocol is cut, poison, or burn. When someone is so vulnerable, receiving a life-threatening diagnosis, what do you suggest can be helpful to support at that critical um, juncture? Yes, uh, this reminds me of, of, of Hebrews. You know, in, in Hebrews uh, 2, it talks about uh, Satan's approach uh, to, to people. Uh, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Um, I'll just read it here. Uh, mm -hmm. For as much then as the children, that's us, are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also himself, that's Jesus Christ, likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So the devil has the power of death. Well, how does he have the power of death? Verse 15, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And uh, so I spent uh, a while at a sanitarium as the medical director where we saw mostly cancer patients and we treated them with alternative cancer methods, uh, God's healing methods. Mm -hmm. And uh, people, as soon as they got their diagnosis of cancer, were scared to death. Uh, reminds me one day, not long ago, one day we were helping somebody who figured they had COVID. And uh, so we were helping them with home treatments and hot and cold treatments and so forth. And so we went down and got a test kit to see if they really had COVID and they were all worried and fearful and everybody was up and, you know, you're going to die. And then they took the test and they didn't, they didn't have COVID. All of a sudden they felt so much better. They got happy. And it wasn't long they had recovered from whatever it was that was ailing them. Well, it was like, now, wait a minute. You know, you still had the same symptoms. You still were sick. But all of a sudden, the, the fear factor was changed. And so people get the diagnosis of cancer. Well, we had one family came to our institute, three family members with cancer that they'd been diagnosed with serious cancer with with well, supposedly metastases all over their bodies. And, but they were all happy and easygoing. And they said, oh, yeah, we're, we wanted to see what you do at your program here. And 
we've had this cancer for a while, but we just want, and they enjoyed the whole program and they, they were happy and they said, oh yeah, you know, we got this diagnosis of cancer, but it's nothing and, and uh, it's no big deal. And, and uh, we'll probably have it the rest of our lives, but, but uh, nothing to stress out about. And they encouraged other patients that were, you know, seriously worried that they had cancer. And we're like, wow, okay, this makes a difference. And when I was in medical school, we, we were involved in a youth group that was reaching out to the local university. But along came a gentleman who was a Vietnam veteran, and he wanted to join in, and we were happy to have him. And uh, he had, during his Vietnam uh, experience, had never gone over to Vietnam, but during that era, he had gotten a toxic exposure to mega doses of, 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 of radioactive isotopes. And during the time that I knew him, he went down to Los Angeles to a big research lab and had a test done and found out he had just deadly amounts of radioactive material still in his lungs. And he had tumors all over his body. But the, the doctors would tell him, you know, you, you know, you've got this tumor, you got this, and you've got six weeks to live. And he would just laugh him off and just keep living. And I mean, he'd gotten those kind of reports multiple times that, and he just laughed it off. And it's like, you know, every time they tell me this, they don't know whether how long I'm going to live. And he just, it didn't bother him. And so cancer has become one of those diseases that uh, medical science has uh, through fear, fear of death has put everybody in bondage. And uh, a lot of times their treatments are what kills them. Just like with COVID, it's the remdesivir that's killing people more than the COVID. And, uh, and so, you know, in pro approaching the cancer, then the same approach as other lifestyle diseases is number one, why did you get it until you know why you got it? I mean, if you got it from toxic exposure to some chemical in your environment, well, chemotherapy is just going to be toxic exposure to more chemicals in your environment. You think that's going to cure you. If you don't know what caused it, your cure might be part of the cause. And, and, and so the first thing with cancer is to discover uh, what I did that causes. And sometimes you have to, you know, ask the Lord and pray and, 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 and get some help with what's doing it. And, 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 and I'm working on a whole discussion of, I haven't got this talk together, but uh, disease being a call from God to self-examination. I mean, it is. And so cancer then with its, uh, all its, uh, you know, surrounding fear is really a good call for people to, to figure out what might be in their life uh, spiritually that might have set them up for, for this, this terrible disease. And, uh, and so, you know, what do I suggest to help support somebody at that juncture? Yeah, we, there's a, a book that's very good. Uh, a friend of mine from, from Yuji Pines uh, wrote this book, Dr. Sandoval, called mm -hmm. uh, um, The Law of Life. Let's see. If I look around, I should have one here somewhere. Oh, yeah. Here we go. All right. Law of Life. Um this book, uh, he goes into basically what causes disease from mind-body connection, the law of life. And you can get it on Amazon. That's where he sells it mostly, uh, Mark Sandoval. And uh, very good mind-body connection book to, to think about this from a spiritual aspect, uh, spirit prophecy and Bible-based and very good logic. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, Mark Sandoval um started worked at Eugene pines for a lot of years and now he's gone to start his own separate ministry and mm -hmm. uh, actually lives about uh, two hours from me here and we're going to have him at our church doing a whole program come a few weeks from now nice Thank you very much. Um, so we, we've got questions on YouTube but let's just see. Um, 
Uh, so my friend has low sodium. The friend also has, um, well, my, my friend has enlarged heart, um, rheumatoid, autoimmune disease. Um, she is on cortisone tablets. Um, um, uh, the friend has been advised to restrict fluids to one liter per day. Um, it is complicated. Um, do you have any observations, suggestions about this, please? Yes, a lot of your autoimmune disease and particularly rheumatoid arthritis has a lot of uh, mind-body connection issues with it. Uh, there's people who get rheumatoid arthritis when something bad happens in their life, um, major stressful event. And so you definitely want to address that. But the, aside from that, going to our autoimmune disease a lecture, Either you can go to my website and download the notes um, or you can watch it as a video. And I would just uh, take them through that. And there are causes for autoimmune diseases and there are things that help uh, get rid of them. And we've had people, rheumatoid arthritis, they have gone totally free from rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, their lab reports show they were totally free from it. Lupus, um, different diseases like that. Uh, We've had people that had it and then they don't have it anymore because they followed God's good healing methods. Mm -hmm. Very good. So, um, uh, Dr. Clark, do we have time for a few more questions or? Um, yeah, how? we can go a little longer here. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So, um, I have now the question is, I guess it's a half question, half a statement. I have now heard of two cases in the last couple of months of people receiving higher than normal dose of chemo or other interventions. As a result, suffering major complications and um, one of them has even passed away. What can be done in such cases? Can a person be saved after a high dose of chemo? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, remembering that God can save us from anything, that he can heal anything. On the other hand, uh, chemo isn't a part of his plan. <laughs> mm -hmm. And sometimes we reap what we sow. That said, uh, people who have had uh, symptoms from, from chemo, we have treated, for example, a common thing is peripheral neuropathy or pain or numbness in the in extremities. And so using hot and cold treatments uh, will reverse that, has helped that, has, has made people better from that. Uh, sometimes uh, taking lots of charcoal to get any residual chemo out of the system is beneficial. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, using things like a heating sheet pack, um, which uh, is a whole nother discussion of different hydrotherapy techniques, but a heating sheet pack to get people to sweat out toxins is very helpful uh just getting in a sauna and sweating stuff out can be good um mm -hmm. taking uh, certain uh, uh foods that are especially high in antioxidants you know go on a raw food diet definitely beneficial so there's all kinds of things depending on yourself this you know part of it would be figuring out what symptoms this person is having as a result of their high dose chemo and perhaps even studying the per the particular chemo therapeutic drug that was taken and what it's what it's a, a supposed mechanism is and what it's mm -hmm. uh, toxic profile is and then and then knowing the mechanism of how it caused uh, derangement uh, taking natural remedies that would reverse that so it would, it would it would sort of be on an individual basis but definitely i would say there's hope and uh, definitely you want to be praying over the person as you're doing your simple natural remedies Mm -hmm, that's true you mentioned as well last time or last few times actually dr clark that sometimes um we have to confess we have to be right with god and maybe that's um partly or a major part of why we're not healed um is that right definitely can be that's for sure um definitely can be 
Yeah, so when I received this question, the person was saying that um, it was their friend, actually, that um, she had a different issue and she was given medication for that. I believe it was chemo. Um, and then um, she was just in case, I believe. Um, sorry, so she had cancer and the cancer was removed after which they decided to give chemo just in case. And I have heard... Uh, now a few times of this just in case chemo and they have given her chemo just in case and they have given her too much the person told me and uh, after which um, she has um, she's feeling really sick she can't even eat um, so I wasn't sure if when a person can't eat anymore if there is something that could be done in that case Yes, uh, if they can't eat, there's certain things you can do. Um, when a person can't eat, that might be a time when uh, juicing would have its role. Um, also, uh, there's been people who have been down to having no energy, no strength, and they started giving them nutrition through enemas. Um, and so that can be beneficial. Oh, second, buddy phone's making a noise here sorry uh so uh that's another route to get nutrition into somebody um so each person you'd have to take each case on its own and figure out its problems and address them yeah absolutely thank you for that um so and then obviously there was another question that you touched on the use of supplements. Um, can he explain the reasons for this? You did mention about extracting just one component or just one type of um, vitamin E. I guess just in general, if the body is going to struggle to recognize what we are putting in it, um, it's not gonna be beneficial even if it comes from the carrots, right? Right, yes. It's yeah. a it's a yeah a bit of a fallacy a way of you know making a lot of times the reason these companies don't recommend you eat more carrots because you can't patent the carrot and you can't make a lot of money off of it but uh, if they can make it into a magic potion and a pill then they can make a lot of money off of it yeah absolutely um uh, okay so that was the question that you addressed about arrhythmia and other heart conditions um, so there is, there was another question about headache and, uh, what causes headache and what is the best thing to do? All right. And maybe we'll make this the last question. Yeah. And uh, so headaches, uh, in your brain, only thing that hurts uh, is the blood vessels and, uh, some of the membranes, the meninges and so forth. The brain itself does not hurt. And so it's largely going to be blood vessels uh, that are going to be the, the source of the pain. Mm -hmm. And anything then that affects blood vessels will increase the likelihood of pain in the brain. Poor blood supply, uh, inflamed blood supply, um, things that to cause the blood vessels to spasm, uh, things that cause the blood vessels um, uh, to, to get uh, um, more, what would we say, cytokines. And, and, and so in a diet and lifestyle to fix headaches, first thing we do is to improve blood flow. So that would be drink plenty of water and uh, do hydrotherapy. The most important hydrotherapy is to do a hot foot bath where you put a cold pack on the head and the feet in hot water. And that tends to send the congested blood away from the head. As far as diet goes, you definitely want to be eating lots of antioxidants, but you want to avoid the vasoactive foods, foods that cause the blood vessels to spasm, such as caffeine, such as tyramine from fermented foods like cheese, wine, vinegar, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the next thing you definitely want to avoid is MSG, monosodium glutamate, and that would be in fermented foods and in spices and natural flavors and yeast products and, and that kind of thing. And... Uh, and then um, things that cause inflammation, uh, fried foods, fermented foods, um, lots of oils in the diet, definitely. So, so our approach to, to somebody with a headache 
is to remove the things that cause the problems and then have them drink lots of water and do hydrotherapy and uh, good exercise. All the eight natural doctors have benefits for, for headaches. We've had people with the, you know, unstoppable headaches and, and then, and then they got better. Um, you know, we have a, a friend that says he's had people with headaches and said that was sign that there might be, you know, uh, oppression or possession going on, but I wouldn't go down that route immediately. Uh, I would go to, you know, what's physiologically happening and, and, and approach it that way. My husband is um, cured sometimes from his headache by just drinking water, <laughs> more water than he does. So yeah. I guess that's um, just a simple thing that you don't think of, but um, yeah, that can cause that. So, um, and Dr. Clark, maybe uh, there was a question about depression. Um, I believe you have a talk on um, depression or it's just mind health. I'm not sure. Maybe we can cover that um, in one of the future seminars. Right. Uh, I don't really have a talk per se on mm -hmm. depression. Um, but uh, definitely talk on keeping your mind healthy, uh, keeping your mind sharp. And yeah. uh, I don't know. Let me just look back here. We didn't do that, did we? Let's see. Nope, we haven't done that one. So sometime in the future, mm -hmm. we could cover that. Um, can I just quickly refer uh, the question about the fermented foods? Dr. Clark has a presentation on fermented foods, um, fermented foods, wine, mushroom, mushrooms. I can't remember what it's called exactly, but it's again on um, a Zoom International um, uh, Prophecy School, I believe. Um, yeah, the YouTube channel. Yes, so fermented foods um yeah i will um if if you guys can email me with the questions that were not answered or the information that dr clark mentioned uh to be sent i'll be happy to email everyone um those links and um the um yeah the information that dr clark mentioned so um we do want to have like a mental health month either in may or june we want to have different speakers and so dr clark if you have those um the seminars um or you know the information together like you said about how to keep your mind sharp or um yeah anything about um depression anxiety and um yeah those brain health um talks it will be very much appreciated very good yes uh, well Yep, we have uh, have some of those. Yeah, okay, very good. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Clark. We went well over the hour and a half. Um, thank you for the insights and um, for the questions. Um, someone said as well, most grateful for the insights gained tonight from the principles shared. So um, we are very grateful for the time that you have donated to us. Um, if we can ask you to pray and then, um, yeah, we can close um, with a word of prayer. All right. Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for the time you've spent here with us thinking about health and uh, guiding our minds. Lord, we know you've given us much instruction. And we pray, Lord, that uh, we will take advantage of that and, and read the books and think about it. Lord, we pray that as we go from this hour and uh, continue to live our lives, that we'll make good decisions in what we eat and what we do and how we apply uh, your eight natural principles to, to our health. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much again, Dr. Clark. We are all looking forward to... Um, hearing you next um, Saturday evening for us, morning for you. And yeah, the topic is um, apocalyptic um, famine, I guess, um, touching on food shortages, the Russia-Ukraine war as well, right? That's right, that's right. Yeah, so very interesting indeed. Um, so yeah, God bless and see you next um, Sabbath evening, Dr. Clark.
Yes, thank you. Look forward to it. God bless. Thank you. Um, to everyone else, please, um, uh, if you haven't done already, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Look for us on Rumble as well. Subscribe. Um, you will get notified of all new videos and um, all new content. Also, um, the next seminar, obviously, will be on uh, the food shortages, Russia-Ukraine war on all of um, affecting all of these issues and um, we are planning um, we are planning to have like a mental health uh, month the whole month of may or june we will see depending on what speakers we have uh, watch out for that and um, we will yeah let you know how we go um, thank you. God bless. And looking forward to seeing you next time. Invite everyone that will be interested and will benefit from these presentations. Uh, blessings to all and have a good night.